to start with, this is older than the EEG is. EEG was discovered in 2829 by Berger and, and published at that point. He'd actually worked on it for a decade before he published. Um, he was trying to disprove the EEG as a phenomenon that was real. In, and um, uh, being a, a scientist, he was trying to show himself that it was just some artifact or weird phenomenon. But um, before Berger, they already had discovered <coughs> electrical currents in brains. This was animal work, it wasn't in humans. But this is Briti British Medical Journal number two from 1875. So the DC field potentials within the brain are actually well known and um, precede as a scientific phenomenon the discovery of the EEG itself. And what they basically found is that whenever you use an area in the brain, it shifts to more electronegative. So if you use an area like vision, if you're actually looking at something, the visual area becomes more electronegative. And uh, it, it turns on, essentially. And when you quit using an area, if you shift your attention from your vision to your somatosensory system to what your feet feel like instead of what you're seeing, there's literally a shift within the brain of that electronegative charge gradient. And the area that you're now using lights up electronegative, and the areas that you quit using shift more electropositive. And this is, again, a metabolic phenomenon, the glia, the glial cells are metabolically burning blood sugar and that creates carbon dioxide and water in a test tube if you remember your chemistry from high school. However, in the body you can't, you, you don't have carbon dioxide bubbles that float up to your lung and pop and, and get exhaled. This isn't how it works. The body buffers that as a bicarbonate ion which is negatively charged. So when you metabolically burn sugar which is what your brain, brain basically burns unless you're starving. And it's really the only thing it burns unless you're starving. It'll start to consume itself at that point. It'll burn the lipids and proteins. But really, it only burns blood sugar. So uh, the source of the DC field potentials that we're talking about is metabolic and glial, not neural. So this is not the brain's neurology generating the the signal. This is the brain's glia. You have about one, uh, between 10 and 100 times more glia than neurons. Uh, they, they do these by estimates. They don't actually count the neurons and count the glia, but um, uh, the, the glia are a major uh, presence within the brain. When I learned EEG and brain structure, we were taught that glia were a scaffolding to hold the brain together and it might provide some metabolic support, but it was really pretty much just the glue that held it together. We know much better than that now. If you look at the brain uh, structurally, the neurons have white matter. Where did it come from? Well, glia knit the myelin sheath around the axons. They actually form the white matter. When your brain is damaged, if you could look with a photomicrograph at the surface of the brain, you'll find glia migrate like little spiders. They literally migrate and move over to the damage to help repair it. So the glia aren't just this scaffolding and, you know, big food source for the neurons, which are the real, you know, brain that we think of. So you have to th start thinking in terms of glia being something that are important, not just a scaffolding to hold things together. We, we know that it shifts negative whenever the brain is more active. And we also know that you have to have a gradient. A gradient is how many microvolts difference you find across a millimeter or so. So it's a spatial gradient. You have more charge here, it drops off as an edge, and you have less charge here, right next to it. 
and we, we can see in animals 150 to 200 microvolts difference a millimeter or so away. So these are big hard edges that can happen. The field potentials are uh, structural as well, not physical structural, but they have an edge. So you have charge gradient here, an edge, and a lower charge gradient immediately right next to it. And the DC system in the brain literally can turn on and off the ability of a neuron to discharge. And as such, these gradients are needed in order to literally turn on and off the ability of a neuron to have an action potential. And basically 50 years later, the EEG is published about by Berger. Please. You can't see that because when we're looking at the EEG from the scalp, that tends to be very smeared. But if we had wires in the brain, it, we could in, in fact, you see it. Okay. Uh, if you don't filter out the low frequency end of the spectra, uh -huh. the baseline that the EEG is riding on is the DC gradient. You know, it's it's more negative. the The baseline will rise up. Your little wiggly EEG is going to go up. You know, it's the baseline that's rising. Right. Now, sometimes in your databases, it looks like delta because the baseline will rise and then fall. You turn an area on and then off. And as such, in a database, quite often when you see delta deficits, it's not really a delta deficit. It's a, de it's a, a decrease in the dynamics of the slow cortical potential. It's not going up and down like it did before. You're not turning the area on and off and on and off dynamically. It's just <laughs> flat. So the cortical dynamics can decrease and you literally are going to see that as a delta decrease in your database. It's not delta. It's slow cortical potentials waxing and waning. And uh, that again looks like delta to a database. Uh, if we have someone hooked up today, we will end up seeing, we can, sh we can open the filters up to actually look at the DC signal. And at that point, you're going to see that the baselines drift all over the place. Big drifts, 200 microvolts worth, so sometimes more. Probably all of us are using filters then on the low end. Yes. <laughs> Not even yeah. Traditionally, in the United States, in biofeedback, we cut off the low frequency end and throw it away with our filters. In Europe, however, they cut off the high frequency end and looked at the slow cortical potentials. Niels Burbomer's work in Germany uh, at Tübingen University uh, is basically slow cortical potential work. They trained uh, people to voluntarily control the DC signal within the brain and they actually have better literature support for efficacy for slow cortical potentials than they do for SMR in epilepsy. It's a much deeper, richer literature. And it's published in places like Epilepsia, which is uh, uh, the major journal you're going to want to publish in if you're publishing about epilepsy. So the, uh, their work is blinded and placebo controlled. It's very, very well done. Uh, scientifically rigorous studies and um, uh, we'll, we'll discuss what they're training it for and everything as we get into the clinical application of this in a little bit. And in fact, apparently the optimist is Yeah, and, and they're, uh, they're training sequentially uh, uh, between two sites. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, as we get into this. But first, let's start to understand some of the classic slow cortical potential literature in neurophysiology. So you have a little bit of a, a foundation to start to understand some of the reasons 